I think for our style of music, the organic fluctuation is very important. We switch into a, we shift into a, a different riff or something, and maybe the tempo fluctuates in a way that would be kind of weird. Weird if we mapped it out. We're like, okay, we're gonna drop five BPM here, you know? And like, I don't want to think like that. I just want to play the music, and that's I. Don't, I will never, you know rag on a band that uses click tracks or any of that stuff i don't care if that's their thing that's their thing but for us there's and for me there's no greater joy than going out on stage with our instruments plugged in the amps and making this shit from scratch hey what's up everyone matt here from cryptopsy and the host of the vox and hops metal podcast i hope that you had a killer weekend i most certainly did this Fox and Hops episode is presented by Heavy Montreal. Heavy Montreal are Montreal's premier metal promoter. And if you are ever in Montreal, trust me when I say this, if you are looking for a killer show to go to, Heavy Montreal will have you covered. I am beyond stoked to have Heavy Montreal behind the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. Now, before we jump into today's episode, I'd just like to ask you to follow the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, I would love for you to tell a friend about the podcast. If there's someone in your life that just loves extreme music and loves craft beer, well, you should definitely let them know that the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast exists. You could tell them that there are over 400 episodes where I sit down with some of the world's best metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while enjoying craft beers. If you were to encourage one of your metalhead beer-loving friends to become a brand new Vox and Hops head, that would be something that I would truly appreciate. Now today on the podcast, I'm very stoked to be back with Zachary Ezrin of Imperial Triumphant and Fulter Comma. Get ready everyone, this is Vox and Hops episode number 451. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today, I'm very stoked to be back with Zachary Ezrin of Imperial Triumph and Fulter Kammer. Uh, Zach, so good to be back with you. Always a pleasure to hang out with you. Last time we hung out was here in Montreal. You're here with Zeal and Ardor. Uh, you guys just mm -hmm. destroyed that crowd that night at Studio TD. I, I just that was a great show. Load. I think it was the first time I'd seen you live. I think. I think so. So, so dissonant and and disturbing. Just exactly. What that Imperial Triumph is supposed to be about. We are recording this on a very special day uh, as uh, my beautiful wife walks into the room right now. This is Valentine's Day, and we swapped uh, this interview up for a different day uh, due to some scheduling conflicts. And uh, I only realized today and or yesterday that it was Valentine's Day that we're doing this. So uh, happy Valentine's Day to my wife who just walked in. Happy and, Valentine's uh, Day. <laughs> all of that just to say, Zachary, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I uh, also didn't realize it was valentine's day until we had switched so <laughs> i i'm glad to be here and i'm glad to be uh chatting with you on the, such a special holiday it is a special holiday and i have a special beer just for that uh, it is vox and hops where i hang out with my metal friends talking about their lives and music while sharing craft beers uh, what do you got on your side there zachary that we're going to be sharing tonight i have a really local craft beer called red stripe yes. it's a jamaican lager um I uh, I like these actually. They're really e they go down really easy, and they're also like uh, maybe one ounce smaller than your regular beer. So it's kind of you kind of feel like a giant when you hold it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of fun. You get so mad. Uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> give us those thirty three CLs in Europe, and we're like, we want two cases of beer, and then they deliver these mini bottles, two cases. And we're like, no, no, no. We oh want my gosh. true two cases of beer because we're Cryptops and we like to drink beer. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny about Europe. They either give you like the mini beers yeah. or you're in parts of the country where they give or you like the big. mega beers and everyone's just like <laughs> with their flagon. <laughs> um, I was, I was before we, I saw what you were drinking before we pushed record and I said I'd tell you what we're recording. Uh, my first Red Stripe, I believe, is in Shetfield, England on the Cryptopsy Beneath the Massacre tour with ignominious incarceration and trigger the bloodshed i can't remember all those names back in wow. 2009 Deep. and we were at some horrible dance club on a day off in shetfield england and i don't like dance clubs and i don't go to dance clubs and i did that night and i drank my first red stripe that night it was um it, i guess it was memorable since i remember that much of it all <laughs> <laughs> of course you remember you remember a lot what are you drinking I am drinking a perfectly thematically uh, correct beer. It's called Bière de Calais. Uh, Calais in French means hug. 
So it's like a hug beer. It's like a, two lovebirds, you know, two two pigeons. Uh, I it's like from that. L'Espace Public. Uh, it's it's perfect for right here. It's a 7.5% uh, uh, sur d'amour, so a, a love sour. <laughs> just, just amazing. <laughs> I love it. And I saw it today, and I was like, this is too thematically perfect. So I'm, I'm taking that. Uh, shout out to Simon and the rest of the peeps that run uh, L'Espace Public. Love them. I'm going to crack this, and I would love to hear about your craft beer evolution. I know last time we were together, you were drinking like a big double IPA. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I first had you on the podcast, it was at the beginning Four of years ago. the pandemic. I remember it was one of those when Thirsty Thursdays were just happening, and I had you booked at 8 p.m., and then I had a Thirsty Thursday at 9 p.m., and I remember like literally finishing, wrapping up with you, and then jumping into Thirsty Thursday, never oh, expecting yeah. seeing what Thirsty Thursdays would grow into over the years. So how has your craft beer palette evolved since, uh, you know, four it's years? It's a great question. Well, since we've spoken, we've done a lot of touring. And so I've been able to try, cheers, of course, I've been able to try a lot of different beers. I, you know, as an American, I got to go drink Guinness in Dublin, which is like yes. something everybody always talks about. Yes. It was, it was pretty wonderful. I had many, many, many. And it was, and then I uh, was, we were playing in Belgium. And me and my bass player got ripped before the show on That's Duvel. Yeah. Those are like so Yeah, because they give you the case. They give you your, your typical rider amount of beers, except they're all eight percenters. Yeah, they're so strong and so smooth, which is such a dangerous combo. So we got those. Uh, where else have we been drinking beers? That's just wonderful. Um, I mean, I'm not a huge beer drinker. I'm really more of a tequila guy. And Lately, as a, as pr apropos, I've been drinking a lot of champagne and prosecco. Oh. But um, I think I've been lately. I've been enjoying a lot of uh, sour beers and stuff like that, like it, kind of just funky stuff like that. Um, I enjoy a good IPA, and then actually, since we've spoken, we did play the. In 2021, I want to say, with the Decibel Metal and Beer Festival. Oh, yeah. Shout out to Albert. He's a wonderful man. And we were paired with Adroit Theory Beer Brewers. Oh, yeah. Shout out to Mark. And uh, it was very funny. I was like, you know, I was just thinking like classic me, like just being like, look, I don't care what this beer tastes like. I just want it to sell. Let's just yeah. make a delicious beer. I don't care. And, uh, he was like, "Don't worry, we're gonna make an imperial Russian stout." Yeah, and I was like, "Just stouts, yeah." I was like, "Dude, that sounds disgusting." <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> and he said, "Don't worry, we're gonna send me your coffee that you guys make because we do a yeah. coffee." And he says, "Send that to me, and we'll put it in the beer." And I said, "That sounds absolutely gross." And so I send him the coffee, and then the day of the festival, we arrive, and I meet him. And we try it, and it's eleven percent, and I'm like, "Oh my god, this is gonna be so foul." And I tried it, and it was so smooth, so delicious, and it sold out almost instantly. I was very, very impressed because I'm not a guy who usually crushes really strong beers. In fact, you're gonna really hate this. Lately, I've been drinking like Bud Lights, really, which, but I have a, I have, I can defend myself on this. To me, it's not beer. And if you don't think about it like a beer, it's actually not bad. It's only so if, if you're you, not thinking of it as a beer, what do you think of it as? <laughs> like like a like an alternative to water, like just a refreshing beverage. Like when they're ice cold, it's great. It's just if you dare to consider it uh, in the same category as beer that you're like, absolutely not. And I think people might agree with me on that. Like, it's definitely because I would agree it's definitely not beer for sure, but it's, it's not crusher. bad. It's a crusher. I'll give, I'll give you that. No, Droid Theory does make a killer, killer beers, typically big, heavy beers. And I've had a yeah. few of them. Uh, they made a collab for Pig Destroyer. That was just killer. And I've had a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, I had Mark on the podcast. Very interesting, dude. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very nice gentleman. I think it's yeah, awesome. their, their, their beer was incredible. And yeah. I got to say, like, there is definitely something to be said about, like, well-made craft beer. There's, like, it's something that it's, like, it's different than a beer you might be drinking, like, a regular just crushing beer all day. 
party kind of beer. This is like, it's more akin to a wine, I guess, you know, where uh-huh. you're, you're tasting it for flavor and you're, you're enjoying it with pairing it with food and stuff like that. So there's definitely like, it's, it's a multifaceted beverage for sure. I definitely agree. It's like music. You can look at uh, the, 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 the Bud Lights as, as radio rock and Imperial Triumphant as a craft beer. For sure. Yeah, we definitely aren't <laughs> easy going down that smooth. No, you're not. <laughs> talk, talk to me about something that when I had you on last time, I guess I didn't know or you weren't doing it at the time. Talk to me about the champagne, the Prosecco on stage. Where where did this come from and the, the whole idea of it? And I can only imagine uh, hypothetically in a bumpy trailer, some of these bottles exploding sometimes. It's. Uh, I'm glad you brought it up. It's definitely something that has evolved over the years of touring. It started in 2020 when we were asked to open for Behemoth on like a streaming thing. Yeah, that was huge. And we and we were. It was an unbelievable opportunity. In like an and old we church, were, am I crazy? They were in an old church. We That's were cool. in an old speakeasy because we're from oh. New York, and mm-hmm. it just seemed more appropriate. And we were thinking, like, what can we do? What could, like, what sort of, you know, theatrics can we bring to a live stream? And I ended up pouring a bottle of Dom Perignon on, like, the Statue of Liberty, like a miniature Statue of Liberty. And uh, just, like, to just waste it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it just Take seemed the most... Consumerism. De- <laughs> consumerism. <laughs> yeah, it just seemed like the most decadent thing I could do. Yeah. And... Um, then we were just thinking that like our next last the t- the next tour after that we were like what if we just poured champagne in the th- in the mouths of the front row like sort of uh, as this sort of like Eucharist ritual of decadence yeah. you know and we did that and it was cool but we were like we're burning through a lot of champagne yeah, very and I was like the first few shows is crazy I was buying like Moet and and like <laughs> like. People are hide sick and like crazy like 100, expensive. 100, 100, 100. Yeah, because I was like, I was like, we're Imperial Triumph and this has to be super decadent, you know. <laughs> and then um, I quickly realized like this is not gonna, this is not financially stable. This plan, <laughs> and I uh, just happened to become friendly with uh, through a friend of a friend, um, a gentleman in Nashville who owns a uh, distribution company for liquor. And he's like, I can absolutely hook you up with some Prosecco. Nice. So we have a connection where we're, he, it was pretty funny. He called us up on tour. We were playing in Nashville and he says, come, come by the warehouse and I'll have the guys drop off a pallet. I was like, how? Holy shit. No, yeah. That's like, and I was like, all right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, and we were, we were on like a short run too. We were on like 12 shows and he, we, we end up filling the van up with about 124 bottles of 12 cases. Oh, of champagne shit. or prosecco, and uh, it was so funny. The rest of the tour is just clanging in ding, the ding, back, ding, 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 ding. and then just every show, <laughs> all right, let's grab another one. And now it's crazy because we have, uh, I just have bought cases of champagne everywhere in my house. I hide them, just try, like build furniture out of them, try to like get them out of my use. Yeah, yeah, any yeah. birthday party, I'm bringing you a bottle for sure. <laughs> and uh, and it's interesting, you know, we started doing it in Europe. Uh, How did you get them over there? Did you well, shoot? in Europe, they give a shit about what's on your rider, so, so we just put it. we just put it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, oh, there's like a lot cargo freighting it over. <laughs> exactly, exactly. They're they're pretty cool, and it, it's cool because in like different parts of the Europe, they'll have, give you different stuff. You know, okay. like you're in Spain, they'll give you cava. Exactly. You know, in Italy, they give you prosecco. In France, they make sure you champagne. get champagne. Yeah. I played champagne once, like the city champagne. That's sick. It was sick. Yeah. And you know, it's it's pretty funny. Like I, uh, we played Hellfest this summer, and it's such a brutally hot day, and I didn't understand the physics of champagne as much as I do now. And so I normally like I'll open the champagne a little bit to just like just to twist it a little bit, so that when it's time to do it. I don't have to be twisting forever. Yeah. So I'm walking in the backstage area, <laughs> getting ready to go on stage, and I just twist it a little bit and just explodes <laughs> this bottle of Moet. And so I was like, oh my God, like I just can't, I had the cum shot way too early. <laughs> and I called my tour manager. I was like, I need another bottle. And he goes, they don't have another bottle. Oh, so I had, to, I had to make do. But 
ideally it, it is kind of a um it's a ritualistic thing that sort of you know we we now it's not just pouring in the champ in the mouths but we're spraying it into the crowd yeah. it's this ritualistic cum shot of decadence and it's pretty wild it's really um interesting because we usually do it in the middle of the show and after that we go we go into a song and the energy in the room has changed the crowd gets a little wilder all of a sudden and it's they're almost like unhit uninhibited as if they're drunk on this which they're not of course but like it it does you know shape the room a little bit and as we are a band that doesn't speak yeah. during our set yeah it's very important to us to connect with the audience through ways that we you know we interact with them in ways that aren't talking to them mm. and what's really interesting is now that we're starting to play bigger shows and perform with act you know like more like giant live nation theaters and stuff we're getting a lot of pushback on this. I was, I, it's, I've been waiting for you to stop talking to ask this question. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> and uh, it's, you know, I've had some fights with some stage managers because it's yeah. in our tech rider, but they don't read it sometimes. So they're does that surprised. Come from, like, venue staff, or does it come from the other band's crew? No, it's it from the venue staff. Yeah. I've never had another band complain about it. Because you're know. sticking up the stage type thing, like if you're if you're touring with Guar, you know you're touring with what it's going to be. You know? Exactly, I think it, often it comes along with like uh, they don't want us getting you know monitors wet. Exactly, they, they don't yeah. want yeah. alcohol on stage. They don't want glass on stage. Yeah, and you're, you're doing. Both. I uh, <laughs> so we were trying to figure ways out, but also at the same time, it's like maybe it we won't be for, it won't be forever, you know. Mm. or it's at the point where if you guys get big enough you can just pay the fee and it's worth paying the fee it is but i will say this it doesn't work as well when you're playing to a thousand two thousand yes, people and there's a 15 it's foot gap. photo yeah, I, pit i hate the photo you know? pits so it's like you can't um yeah you can't i can't even get into, like sometimes i jump yeah onto the knows, railing i don't think to to do that and then sometimes it's too far and i can't do exactly it. so it, i will say this to those who want to see imperial triumphant and want to witness what we've been calling the golden ritual yeah. is that it's it's not forever and it will be certainly only at certain venues and maybe certain it'll become a more unique special thing and i think that's important to the imperial live show because we can't just keep doing the same thing over and over and over. We got to yeah. keep surprising our fans and changing things up. And if whatever we do moving forward, will still be extremely decadent and uh, wild and ritualistic. But that, that, that part of our career might be slowly uh, fading away. Interesting. I, I, I hear that. Uh, talking to, talking to, about not communicating with the fans directly, uh, was that always a thing with Imperial? Did you ever speak to the crowd, or is it something that's evolved over time as well? Uh, as soon as I put the mask on, I stopped okay. talking to the crowd because. How hard did you notice? Sorry, did you notice that there was a bigger like wall of like uh, cohesiveness between yourself and the audience at that point? Well, Did you have like a harder time connecting with them? I'm sure you found ways over the years, but initially, yeah. and then the evolution of that persona. Let's say. I think it started. We were thinking, "Oh, it's just cool. We won't talk to them." You know, like we're going to be aloof. But I quickly realized that it's very important to connect to the crowd. Yeah, and even if you don't have stage banter, you need something to bring them in. Um, and uh, but at the same time. I firmly stand by this thought that we will not sound that we look that cool with my speaking voice coming out of my mask, you know? So I was like, this is not an option. Like, I'm not going to be like doing insane, you know, growls through the mask and then be like, Hey guys, uh, traffic was crazy today. You know, like, <laughs> you know, like I'm not going to 
just switch to my speaking voice that takes away the performance which i think okay. is so crucial to our our show and so we've come up with a lot of ideas you know we have a disembodied voice that comes on that's sort of like a a ringleader of this ritual that talks to the crowd my bass player will go out into the audience and take a solo and stuff like that that's a really that's i mean something like that really connects with the audience and sometimes that's like the the loudest that they're screaming is when he's it's ripping a solo catalyst for the crowd exactly that the that connection into that it's like it's very very important to us and i think that um it is fun to have these restraints on us mm. where we we can't we're not really in a position to say like how's everybody doing tonight and then i'm like mm, that sounds a little quiet i said how's everybody doing tonight you know like, i can't do that little shtick so i need to think outside the box and that's kind of like where i love to exist <laughs> I, I can see that and feel that something that i do find interesting about you wearing the mask and then you as a human uh, a normal person in in the music scene because a lot of people know who you are it's not like this whole sleep token yeah anonymous masked member thing you you still are very much zachary in the public eye from imperial triumphant but when you're on stage yeah. you're different yeah, it seems like a real hassle to so be anonymous. Could you imagine? And in the music industry when everybody knows everything, it's it's ridiculous. It's a modern age where it's not like it's easy to find out who someone is. And it's also just like not only is it a hassle, but it's like this is my career. Yeah. So I'm not like I'm not working at a bank and I need to have like a pseudonym so that nobody Googles my name and sees that I'm in a death metal band, you know, like this, this is what I want to do and why I like my name. <laughs> so I'm keeping it. <laughs> I'm going to keep it. I don't, we did name our masks, but mm -hmm. that is something that it's more of like something we did along the lines of like how kiss has, you know, they each have a nickname for their, makeup yeah something like that you know that's not like i don't expect people to call me by my mask name <laughs> which is what I, I didn't write down it's, it's oh we all we all took names after different gods so it starts, it starts with an I an apollo apollo okay yeah 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 it's um the greek god of uh sun which makes sense yeah <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> Because it's like, yeah, the rays of the sun, you know? So I, I thought that was appropriate. I do I do love how you guys have created, like, performances is above all. And and my experience when I saw you guys with Zeal and Ardor, it was is the pure chaos of it all while it's still being controlled. So I, I, exactly. I, I read that you guys write together. So, so, so talk to me about writing together controlled chaos. It's, it's absolute madness. Yeah. I and mean, when you know it's finished. <laughs> sometimes we write together. Sometimes someone writes everything. We really, really don't put any, yeah, we don't put any restraints on how we can write. Sometimes a song is written. We were like, un, like particularly under rehearse a song before we go in the studio. And then freestyle. So that, yeah, it's a little raw when we record it and we'll that's, do a few takes. We I record so live, cool. which I think is very important because like, like all of you together like in a room yeah with no click like track. really yeah your drummer's really fantastically spectacular he, he's he's pretty good but even him is like he's not a human metronome and he's, i don't we don't want that organic fluctuation really, exactly i think for our style of music that organic fluctuation is very important we switch into a we shift into a, a different riff or something and maybe the tempo fluctuates in a way that would be kind of hard to weird, map out. weird if we mapped it out. Yeah. Like, okay, we're gonna drop five BPM here, yeah. you know. And like, I don't want to think like that. I just want to play the music, <laughs> and that's I don't. I will never, you know, rag on a band that uses click tracks or any of that stuff. I don't care if that's their thing. That's their thing. But for us, there's and for me, there's no greater joy than going out on stage with our instruments plugged in the amps and making this shit from scratch. Just like, you know what I mean? There's I nothing think it's awesome. That... I think I, I just did a chat you with Borkow. 
and I poked him like hard about the the creative differences of uh, the permissiveness of creative uh, approach to black metal. You guys fuse black metal with avant-garde jazz. Um, Rorcal is much more sonically dissonant. Um, death metal is such more rigid. The, the constrictions that we have of what we're allowed to do for some reason, but black metal is a much more permissive genre and i'm wondering where that came from and why it's like that and and obviously you guys are like heavily leaned into the the jazz side of things where there are no fucking rules everything is just creative freedom yeah. and and it's different every time fun. yeah you know if you listen to a jazz record oftentimes by the title it'll say like take two or take exactly. four you know yeah and that's because every time every take was different yeah and they're just trying to capture an energy and a vibe that's so cool. And for us, that's it important. So fucking calculated. Like everything has been thought about. Every little bleh. Thank you. It's well, that it's, one. It's, you know? we're, we're fortunate enough to have played together for many, many years. And that's a huge part of it that I think a lot of bands uh, suffer from. You know? Like if you're a band and you've been together for a decade and now you're at the point where you're sending riffs to each other, that's probably fine. But if you're a new band and you guys all live in different parts of the world and you're sending each other tracks to record together, it's going to sound pretty robotic mm. and cold and soulless, I think, in my opinion, because you guys haven't actually played together. Mm. And I think that's so, so important that you play with the people that you're recording with and that mm. you're performing with because it's it's a conversation at the end of the day. It's... It's your like talking every, to each other like, with your everyone instruments. Has a pulse, right? Exactly. And it takes some I mean, time for musicians' pulses to sync up together. Exactly. You know when you're playing with your band, like when where, they're in their pocket. Yeah. Yeah, we're in their pocket. And when someone maybe have like, and that's another thing that I love about my band is if someone messes up, you know, there's a mistake, the other guys can catch them and pull them back, you know, like pick them up. Like, Someone drops behind the beat. Okay, we will all slow down and you know we'll come back. You don't get the, like the, the dirty eye. You track, don't get the dirty eye. I get the dirty eye from Christian Donaldson when I fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> no man, it's all especially good. now it's that something. we are on the click track and I'm in his ears now. He's he's like, dude. <laughs> no, and again, I don't ever trash anyone who's used the click track. Some music you have to do it, and it's. And I've seen bands that play with click tracks and they sound phenomenal. So it's not, it's just not how we work, you know? I think it's cool. I think it's the 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 freedom and the the creative uh, um, juices and flowing and like waves and catching that, what basically what you record tends to, is like just a glimpse into what that song's potential is in that particular day and something that you're satisfied with. You guys have worked yeah. with so many like a bunch of prolific producers notably like colin trey just just unbelievable to, to have that those ears in there from bands that are also used to experimenting and and yeah freestyling and just trying stuff out and then having genreless music from both of them just incredible pretty fortunate we are it's uh it's very cool and then, like i said like um yeah the song that we record two years later after touring it hundreds of shows like it'll different. sound it'll be different yeah and that's how it was meant, always meant to be you know and i think that's yeah, cool that's cool you know like whatever when you listen to live records of like hendrix it's totally different mm. i mean the that's grateful cool. dead made their whole career out of like the live version my best yeah. friend's a deadhead and he never listens to a single studio album you know that's cool so that's interesting very different than cryptopsy's death metal I, it's, I, I mean, think, I love this shit. I love. But Shirtops is one of the best death metal bands ever to exist. So well, it's I, in my top five for sure. Well, well, well thank you. Well, something else that you guys do a lot of, and I think is very cool, is doing covers of stuff. Yeah. Um, Radiohead recently, other stuff I can't, I meant to write it down, but I didn't write it down. But no worries. Um, and you totally just reinvent the song. You're not doing yeah. these covers like other people do, where it's it's basically just a cover. It could be that band playing it. It's it's a completely reimagined version of that track. Of course, about doing that and uh, how easily uh, choosing these tracks come together. Where do those come from, and how you reinterpret something in an imperial triumphant yeah. way? It's not easy to choose. Well, I guess it's easy to choose, but it's not easy to reharmonize. 
reharmonies, you know, and that's kind of my favorite thing, you know, like when a, a when there's a cover that's a reharmonized uh, version of whatever the original is, like to me, that's so much cooler than uh, just like oh we'll do the cover but it'll, it'll have blast beats you know like uh, okay exactly. yeah yeah i'm gonna <laughs> like, scream instead of saying yeah yeah so it was i think we were just on tour thinking about doing a little you know a covers ep or something just to i don't think we felt uh creatively ready for a new record but we were still like wanted to put get record make something and so we thought of these ideas and when everyone was talking about them, I was like, yo, this is going to be nuts. Like, how are we supposed to make like motor breath sound like us? How are we supposed to make uh, radio head sound like us? You know, like these are songs that are so different and not dissonant at all. But that in lies the challenge and the creative puzzle, which I think we all sort of thrive on. Is that it's like, it's like you almost if you guys like to make your life hard. Well, it's more fun, you know. I mean, would you rather? I, I don't. I like people say like, would you ever do like a portal cover? It's like no, no, it's already like, noisy. <laughs> I was like, well, first of all, our portal cover will sound like portal. You'd have to make it melodic to make it different. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and I would never play it. I would never be able to capture the genius that is portal. So like. It's it is it's perfect the way it is, but like a metal imperial version of, you know, uh, what did we do? We did uh, uh, night in Tunisia. Like that's oh. okay. That sounds weird. I'll I'll check that out. You know, like a, I know like covered... every every time I would uh, I'm friends with Katie and she sends out all the the press stuff, the uh, Susperia PR. Uh, I'm always like, oh shit, that's cool. I gotta listen to that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's more exciting as far as covers go. Even though, yeah, metalheads probably want to hear a song that they know better. You know, like mm. I don't care. Well, hypothetically, like, you're like opening up the spectrum of your fans' palettes too, because if you're doing stuff that is outside of the metal realm. And they're like, well, if they're covering it, hypothetically, I might like it, too, because I like them and they're influencing me to, to try something new. Yeah. I mean, look, I don't know Radiohead, but I'm fairly certain Johnny Greenwood would probably like our cover just oh, by yeah. judging his taste in scoring. Yeah, he's super sick. He's super sick. So oh. I feel like, yeah, these guys might like us. So why shouldn't metalheads, you know, there's. There's tons of weird stuff out there. Hell yes. I knew the smile is really good. That's like two episodes in a row that I'm saying this. My <laughs> the podcast, the, the podcast <laughs> and people are going to be like, okay, dude, we get it. You like the smile. But I literally said it last <laughs> week too. But I'm saying it again. Check out that new The Smile, people. Uh, talk and... to New York. I, I feel like New York is such an important part of your band and yeah. your identity. Where, where does that I mean, come from? Why is that? Like, I'm from Montreal and I love Montreal. Check it out. I'm going to step outside for a second. Oh, really? Can you see? I can see. Can you yeah, see okay. that? So it's, it's, you have no choice but to. <laughs> it's everywhere, man. <laughs> wow. Just surrounded by skyscrapers, and many of them are having a lot of Art Deco referencing and, or references because they're built in the 30s. And it's just in like even the typography of a lot of restaurants and buildings is that Art Deco style. Like it's just ingrained in the culture and it is uh something that's not unique to new york but it's very very prominent here and it's something i think is unique to metal oh. in the sense that i don't think a lot of bands have embraced not, no embraced no. this sort of world because they're it's not it's what they know you know it doesn't work yeah it doesn't work you know if you're from you know a rural town in indiana or you're from norway you might not have the same upbringing you know you might not understand that sort of thing and you might focus more on nature and stuff like that and that's also very cool I, it's, it is really, cool. It's, it's, even, it's a big part of your identity of you you've put that into the band and that is yeah important and i think a lot of people try to like invent something that isn't a part of themselves and that is a hard thing to upkeep you have to write about what you know and that's 
you know, I didn't, I'm not even, I didn't even grow up Catholic or Christian. So I don't even know. I didn't even grow up with that sort of like rebelling against God and devil worshiping stuff like that it wasn't even a part of my life. So like, I really just want to be authentic to myself and to my music and my art. And for that, I need to be true to myself and what easier way to, and then to just talk about your surroundings, you know, like, obviously, you know about this. So cool. And then you did the photo shoots downtown, like. Oh, yeah. I, we shot, we shot in the Chrysler building. We shot exactly. in the front did of the get grill building. For that or did you just like renegade? No, no, no. I, I know people, but uh, yeah, it was all very official. But yeah, we've shot in front of the Brill building. We shot um, during like the height of the pandemic. It was like we shot in front of the Met Light, uh, the what's it called? The uh, Grand Central Terminal, like yeah. in the middle of the street because yeah. there's no cars back then. And it was like, there's no way. And we did a, that was the big centerfold for uh, yeah, Decibel. Decibel Magazine, which yeah. that's a photo you probably would have a hard time taking now, you know, okay, without yeah. getting run over. So that was <laughs> like, yeah, like stuff like that I always loved. And, you know, photographing the band in New York City is very important because we look like some fucking statue you'd see, you yeah. know, like in a it's lobby awesome. or whatever. I, I love it. I love that you committed to the visual aesthetic of the band. It's it's a whole part of the persona. And it's yeah, a part I mean, of this you. whole band is like an art piece if you think about it yeah. you know it's not just about the music even though that's obviously the majority of it but to me the art piece is everything the lyrics this album art the the presentation the stage show like everything is an opportunity to express ourselves creatively and build this little brand that we've developed and you know not every band has to do that obviously but for me, I just thought it would be cool to do that. Like, Especially fun, with the no talking on process. stage, you sort of have to have more to give people to bite into. Oh, I don't have to do anything on stage, man. A mask does everything for me. <laughs> it's amazing. It's That's really now. great. I remember Corey it's, talking about his mask thinking. How, my how mask... Happy. Uh, I mean, it's not great, but we we have like I have like a spray I put down spray down the masks after a show. You have to learn that. Like, yeah, if it's a hot day, we'll leave them out out open outside so like they kind of like dry out, just, like dry out. I mean, yeah, but everyone's like at one point like thrown up in their mask. I'm sure. Really? And, oh yeah, of course, and or just like yeah, I mean it's. But it's a part of you, you know. You, it's kind of interesting to have this piece of, like, I guess it's not clothing, but it's a something you're wearing that you've worn. Like imagine a piece of clothing that you've worn hundreds and hundreds of times, and it's just slowly gotten, you know, damaged. That you keep using it, and it's just like becomes like this to totemic sort of like. Do you do you guys all just have? one of your masks yeah that's dangerous it's we're working on getting that's, that's that's my next question what if you lose it while you're flying where where does the mask go when you're flying it doesn't leave me it's a carry-on it's a carry-on i, I know him. david vincent flies with his hat he has a hat box so yeah uh i have it we have like big pelican cases every time we fly it's you know sir can i open your mask We've gotten a lot like, sir, are you in the band Ghost? You know, like. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, it's, the, everyone's always curious about it. You know, whatever. Like, uh, it, but yeah, it's, it's, they're one of one, but not for long we're working wow. on getting new ones made because we've had the same ones for seven, That's, eight years. And my next question is, is there going to be an evolution in the visual mask aesthetic? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> he who waked knows? people for the audio podcast but <laughs> who knows what the future holds but you I seem think... to you, as much as you love aesthetics and everything you seem to also really like gibson guitars talk to me about that uh yeah i got it's a collab connected. that you got are you endorsed by them now i, I am you showcasing your love of them no i am endorsed with them now i got connected with them uh 
I think in early 2021. And I, uh, yeah, I became very good friends with uh, Cesar, who's like a really, really nice guy and a really, really like great player, which I feel like, you know, if you're the, the C, if you're the CEO of oh, he's the CEO. Gibbs, oh, he's the CEO. Holy shit. Because he's not just, he's not the rep. I was expecting him to be a rep. No, my rep, Matt, is also a really great guy. He's also a really nice guy and also a decent player. But um, I got involved with Gibson through Cesar, and he's just a really nice guy who just wants people to play Gibson. He's a fan first, you know. He's a great player. He's a generous guy, and he's a really uh, – yeah, he's got he, – he, he's, uh, he's just, you know, he's doing great things for the, the brand, you know, which I think they had a bit of a dip. In yeah, 2000s. I was totally going to ask about like Gibson. He's turned them around man. in extreme metal very much compared to like ESP, no. Ibanez. I want to say Gibson. It's kind of funny. I, been more I never, rocky, let's say. Yeah, I never seen thought of myself being a Gibson player, but after playing them, I was like, oh, okay. So these are, if you know, these are completely shreddable. They, oh. they're there's a reason why they're so good or like so well known is because they're very very high quality guitars slash and... plays a gibson like crazy oh he does he plays okay. a lot of them <laughs> not that crazy <laughs> yeah i mean dude you know who plays a gibson is um jimmy Pink. bill bill from carcass okay interesting yeah. he's got a really nice vintage gibson collection we played a couple shows with them in uh u.s and yeah man like his his sound unbelievable and yeah i just i really like playing uh, working with them because i was i wanted to have a a um brand collaboration you know like i wanted That's to cool. have a, yeah. i wanted to have a connection with the brand you know i didn't want just like oh hey you want to represent our company well here's a discount code you can buy whatever you want like i i don't need that you know i wanted to like I like visiting my rep in New York, Matt, and talking with him. And he helps me with like my little projects because I'm I'm ne no Gibson. I, like very few Gibsons I have are stock at this point. They either I get them stock and then I rip them all the shit out and customize it my own and put gold shit all over it because it's just Obviously. that's yeah. kind of how I like I like the creativity of uh, customizing anti champagne stains. Oh my gosh! My <laughs> when I came back from all the European touring and shit this year, I came back to the Gibson like HQ in New York, and like I was like, I need a setup, guys. <laughs> my guitar is so sticky and gross, covered in champagne, and uh, they were like, "What the fuck did you do to it?" It's like the metal parts are like getting rusted and stuff. But I love that, you know. Like I like, like the battle, story. the battle worn yeah. instruments. You know, I don't want my guitars to be pristine i want them to have the character that i've played in hundreds of shows with them a lot to me that's cool i toured with um it was steve the guitarist of belfcore back in the day and he was teching for watain and he got their guitars after a tour and they were like sitting in in the warehouse or something after the tour and he took them um to set them up for the next tour and he opened it up and they were full of maggots <laughs> Yeah, like that's same so but much, different. Yeah. <laughs> that's so much more disgusting than. <laughs> than but, but, but all every all the guitar heads that are listening right now are pissed because I cut you off because you're you 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 mod your guitars. They want to know what you put in them. Oh, I mean, I I usually what do I do? I mean, I mean, it's a lot of uh, like aesthetic appointments, you know, like cosmetic shit. Like for my flying V, I have. Grover Imperial tuners because they look very Art Deco. A lot of my pick guards that I design, I I trace them myself and then send really? them away. Yeah, because they don't make shit like that, you know. Yeah. Oh, the aesthetic, you know, I love it. I love the aesthetic. It's something that cryptopsy we do not work on our aesthetic enough. And I love I mean, to have the, it, it, the extra it's... little thought, motivational thought. Hopefully, after this talk, it's going to fuel me more to have more of a thought <laughs> process towards the aesthetic of cryptops. It's only if you want, you know? No, exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I think For it's us, an important it's, little step up. It makes think decision-making very easy, you know? Oh, We've chosen, okay. like, same way when you think about... Everything else. 
I mean, it's branding at the end of the day. When you yeah. think about like Starbucks has dark green or, um, you know, um, Google has like the red, blue, green, like little circle, you know, whatever. Yeah. Like there's like just color association that exists. Yeah. I feel like branding. we've done that. But the whole extra little mile that you guys have gone, the same way that Behemoth has gone in that direction too. So Yeah, Behemoth is like, when you think of Behemoth, what do you think of like, they love the devil. They love <laughs> they, anything like Burning super, hardcore, yeah, yeah. super anything that's... hardcore Satan shit. Like that's their thing. And they're authentic as hell about it because they're from Poland and that's a really like Catholicism has that country by the balls. So like sure. it Still really, to this day. exactly. So that to, to them, it's, it's, it's means so much more. And that's why people realize that and they acknowledge that. I love it. It's, I love it's it. authentic. You're motivating. You're motivating me. I like it. Uh, speaking yeah, of man. motivating me, this is, I guess, fight the hops for myself would be have a, a more controlled aesthetic uh, direction for cryptopsy. Yeah, um, I mean, you don't have to. It's no, 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 cryptopsy. No, no. I mean, dude, cryptopsy is doing pretty well. I think. I know. I like. I like <laughs> to continually pretty, evolve and and, and challenge myself. So I do this new segment fan. for the past year and a bit uh, called "Fight the Hops," where I ask my guests a short-term goal, something that they're hoping to accomplish for the next month, two months. What are you doing right now, Zachary, to fight the hops? What does that mean? Fight the hops? Like it's just my name. What am I? What am I drinking? Oh, just what am I? My plans are. Yeah, no, like you have a, a short term goal, something that you'd like to accomplish within the next Dude, month. I got short term goal, medium term goal, long term goals. Good. I have them so written down in my home. Yeah. yeah, I'm very career and goal oriented guy. Uh, short term, I would say, well, Folter Kammer has a new album coming out. Oh yes, in April, we're going to be hitting the road late March for a Stop short it. run. Yeah. Just a short run, but we will be probably touring a lot more this year. There's a lot of uh, – that's a really, really exciting project that I think people hopefully will really enjoy because it's sort of a, you know, black metal meets opera twist that I don't think has really been done in the metal sphere yet, at least not to my knowledge. Um, and then Imperial Triumphant has um, – we just announced the Vile Luxury reissue, which has been remixed, remastered, and with a new album cover. Nice. And yeah. And we have new masks for the guests that are available that are nice. oh, working yeah. with. They're really, really cool. And we really worked extremely hard to get the create a product for our, our fans that is high quality and extremely uh, interesting and cool. And we will have some tours announcing soon. And I will also say we're working on a new record at the moment, which I think will turn a lot of heads. Hell yes. Um, how do you manage to balance between so many projects, these two projects? It's hard to have one band, especially when you're yeah. so focused and have such an artistic vision with it. How do, are you dividing yourself into something else now that's somewhat completely different? This is nothing, man. I'm also a uh, CEO of a uh, music pr video production company, Violux really? Studios, where, yeah, we've been shooting a lot of music videos now for other bands. What bands? Have you ever... bands? Give them some shout outs then. Uh, we just did a vitriol video, and I'm about to begin production on an Inter Arma video. Oh. Are they coming back? I hope so. Oh, yeah. And their new stuff sounds amazing. Oh, yeah. I, I was even pitching nurgle on on videos for when we're on tour together and i think yes. he liked my ideas yeah but i have doing that i have yeah like i said i'm working on this graphic novel which is a, is like a you know a new world for me to explore i've been writing a pilot with this guy about some tv drama idea Jesus. it's like yeah it's any, any, busy any, man I like it. It's how my it, it's it makes me feel like I've done a good job if I've been busy in a day. I agree. And I, I like agree. Uh, I to way. think like to think creatively. That's kind of what brings me the most joy in this earth. So uh, the more I can do, the better. Hell fucking yes! I can't remember if I asked this last time. It's the classic Vox and Hop rap it's of question. Sure. Hypothetically, it has uh, evolved in four years. So if I did ask you last time, I apologize. Um, what is your hangover cure? Perhaps you told me last oh. time, but maybe it's changed in the past four years. Yeah, maybe I, I think you told me, I don't remember what I said. I'll give you my hangover cure now. I haven't gotten hungover in a while. 
because I've just been sticking to tequila and uh, or, or or I guess I don't know I've just been slowing down but my hangover cure is you know you wake up and you feel like shit you get a coke coca-cola diet coke if you prefer a bacon egg and cheese from a bodega a gatorade blue if you can find it for the electrolytes to rekindle your brain mm-hmm. pop an advil and uh smoke a joint and then you're 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 at least 75 percent better you'll definitely feel better in the next hour or so after that yeah and Especially that, if you can sneak a nap in too oh of course <laughs> exactly i i anyone listening to this podcast i encourage you to try it at least i i, I don't think it'll do you any harm no no you've already done the harm to yourself at this point <laughs> <laughs> precisely thank you, thank you so so much once again taking the time to hang out with me talking about your life talking about music talking about craft beer i had a blast um thank you so much it. i'm excited uh for all this stuff coming up uh Polter Kammer, the new Imperial Triumphant, uh, all the videos that you're working on, this graphic novel. Uh, you're a busy guy, and I like it very much. I appreciate you, and I'm looking forward to hanging out with you really soon. Thanks so much, man. Massive cheers. Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right today. You know that I love and appreciate that. Man, this is another awesome conversation. I'm so stoked to have Zachary back on the podcast. He is so interesting. I love his uh, approach to the aesthetics of a band, how it's basically an art piece. I think it's just a very, very interesting way to approach uh, creating a, a band, uh, creating an entity. Uh, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot since I had this conversation, and I'm trying to do what I mentioned and drag some of that into Cryptopsy, how can we make Cryptopsy more of an art project? Let's say, what can we bring to it? Back in the day, Lord Worm used to be an entity, and it'd be interesting to have some calculated elements dragged into Cryptopsy's entity to become something more artistic, such as Imperial Triumphant. Um, Massively stoked to have hung out with you again, Zachary. You're awesome, and I can't wait to see you again. Now, if you enjoyed this Vox and Hops episode, you should sign up to the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast's mailing list. You can do that on my website, voxandhops.com. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S.com. And when you do that, you shall receive one email a week that contains all of the details of everything that has happened in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. You will get to see which episodes I dropped recently. You will also get to see which episodes I have coming up. You will get to hear about any projects I have in the works for the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, and you will also be updated on whatever I got going on with Cryptopsy. That's right. Cryptopsy, we just dropped our brand new album back in September of 2023, and we are doing a whole bunch of stuff. We are planning a massive 2024 in the works. Right now, we are in Europe on the unquestionable Blasphemy Tour alongside Atheist, Almost Dead, 72 Legions, and Monastery. And then after that, we are coming back to the U.S. and some Canada dates alongside the mighty Death to All. That's right. I'm so stoked that Cryptopsy is opening up that tour the Scream of Perseverance tour. I am so goddamn stoked about that. And we even have some more things in the works that I'm super stoked about. You also get to see which albums the Vox and Hops album review crew have reviewed recently, and you will get to see which albums Jerry Monk, Vox and Hops' metal architect, has added to the Brutal Awakenings playlist. There's always a lot of stuff going on in the world of the Vox and Hops metal podcast, and I hate when you miss a single thing, so do me a favor and sign up to the mailing list. The Vox and Hops metal podcast is brought to you by Sound, Talent Media, and Evergreen Podcasts. I hope you have a killer rest of the week. I will be back next week with another episode on Tuesday with Andromeda Anarchia, the vocalist of Zach's other project, Folter Kammer. But until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hops heads. Oh,